We lost one of the greatest voices of the 1980s and beyond when Tony Lewis, the esteemed voice and bassist of the multi-platinum power pop band, The Outfield, passed away at just 62 years of age. Man, Tony, he was a lights out vocalist. He had that distinct voice that made The Outfield a mainstay of the decade when Your Love went to number six in 1986. I just want to use your love tonight. He was preceded in death by his blood brother and musical partner, guitarist, songwriter, John Spinks, who sadly passed away from cancer in 2014. You know, Tony and John just had a special chemistry and we all feel it in every song that we hear of the outfields. It's just really unique. From their first single, Say It Isn't So, you just knew that the outfield were here to stay. They were masters of melodic rock. I mean, rock songs with surefire, catchy riffs, drummer Alan Jackman's driving beat, and of course, out of this world, incomparable background vocals. These were songs that you, you sang along to and you listened to until your cassette tape wore out. For me, it was the high-pitched, straight ahead, grab you by the throat lead vocals of Tony that pushed the band over the top and well above a lot of the other bands at that time. Like many of you, I distinctly remember buying Play Deep after I discovered them from the radio. I was so excited to show my friends my musical discovery because all the songs were great on that album. And of course, they followed me and they, they became massive fans, bought the album. And that's one of the tricks to this band. You know, the music of the outfield, it reached across the aisle better than any band of its day, really. I mean, you know, the metalheads, the, the, the preppies, the wavers, the cowboys, the jocks, the gearheads, the geeks, all of them loved him some outfield. Uh, Tony Lewis had a voice that was just this grand, spiraling extravaganza of human emotion. And I'm so grateful that I had the opportunity to sit down with Tony and discuss his life from the first song that he heard that inspired him to form a band to his unique partnership with uh, guitarist John Spinks, um, and also the stories behind the outfield's biggest songs. And I'm gonna share uh, a portion of that interview here. You know, one note, we touch upon their biggest hit in this, Your Love, in, in the interview. Uh, but for an in-depth mini documentary on that song, please click on our link below to watch it at Professor of Rock Vivo channel. We've got, again, a long a mini documentary that goes through that entire song. Make sure to subscribe to this channel to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. That's what it's all about. Here's Tony. Just growing up in the 60s, hearing the Beatles on the radio, I uh, yeah. was lucky enough to be in that evergreen period where I suppose it transcended into our, our songwriting, I suppose, because through that, John was able to write Your Love and Say Isn't So, them songs that still stand up now. But there's not one particular song that stands out. But I remember uh, hearing uh, Penny Lane for the first time on the radio. I was oh, about yeah. nine years old. Penny Lane is in my ears and in my eyes. And that song, it just goes beyond a song, it's like a, a message. It wraps around you and it tells you, you're going to be safe. And I don't know why I felt that way, but it's just, you know, I, it was, I was lucky to be brought up and, and, and obviously with John as well, to be brought up in that time period. Well, of course, you guys started in the late 70s, a band called Series B, right? That's right, yeah. Power pop trio right in the middle of punk rock. Yeah, just before it exploded, you know, we've, we, we're have playing in pubs and playing all around London and then the punk thing exploded and, I mean, I, I did understand it. It had to happen at that time. I, I liked Sex Pistols. I liked what they did to the music industry, turn it around on its head. And we just took a break from that and, you know, just, well, we're not, not going to try and compete with that. <laughs> yeah. Well, then you performed as the baseball boys in the early 80s. You got back together and I heard that was influenced by the Warriors, that, that title. Yeah, well, it was, we were trying to get a record deal in, in, uh, in London, uh, me and John, and... Um, he wrote on the back of a cassette tape, the baseball boys, and he'd seen a street gang. The street gang from the film, The Warriors, was the baseball boys. They would go around, you know, hitting everyone over the head with a baseball. <laughs> right. And there was no connection with the sport, but when we got uh, 
connected up with American management and they said you can't use a name like the baseball boys in America because it's a national sport. So they ch- it got changed to the outfield because there's three, three people in the outfield part of the pitch and there was three of us, so it made sense. And then demo got you signed an um, 84 CBS. And yeah. I heard that, that you guys didn't even know what an outfield was because baseball is no. not prevalent in England. No, there's know? an outfield in cricket and none of us are cricket fans either. You know, <laughs> right. you watch a game of cricket and you're like, <laughs> tea on the lawn, you know, and cucumber sandwiches. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's not our sport. We like football. That's well, 1985, you guys released Play Deep, and you were bigger here than in your own homeland. You yeah. Know? American management just was focusing on USA. And obviously, it went, translated to uh, South America. But yeah, we're, we couldn't get arrested in London. <laughs> and it's, it's a bizarre story, but not a bad situation to be in. The album cover is so classic. Yeah. I mean, that's one of those album covers from the 80s that you always remember. And of course, again, going to number nine, but also three times platinum here in America. And let's jump right into Say It Isn't So, because that was a song that right off the bat, I mean, hit number 18 on the rock charts. But I love that great beginning where you come in with that vocal well. I mean, that really sets up, this is who the outfield is. You're gonna hear these incredible background vocals. Tell me about that song, what you remember about recording it. I remember doing the demo and what made the intro work was we did a reverse snare, like, that yeah. sort of military sort of, and that's what gave that song a, a kick. But uh, funny enough, me and John, we, we agreed, I mean, that it's our least favorite song to play live. We, we like the song, yeah. don't get me wrong, but it's not free flowing as All Love in the World and Your Love and 61 Seconds. Uh, and we understand why the song works. But uh, yeah, we thought this song had a, a lot of potential as a demo. But when it was a big hit here in 85, well, it wasn't a huge hit. We just did well nationally. Yeah. We went home in 85 for that Christmas period. And Your Love was just put onto AR radio just to keep us in people's minds and to keep us on the radio while we was off tour. And the, the song just had a life of its own. Went from spring to the summer. And then all of a sudden, this song that we didn't think was going to even be a single was was big, you know, and it was bizarre. I love the the background vocals when right off the bat, you got me all screwed up. When you come in with that, I just, I love that. You got me all screwed up. So much I can't yeah, yeah, I can understand how people, yeah, I, a lot of people say, oh, it reminds me of the relationship I was in and got me all screwed up and it can, you can relate oh, yeah. to people's situations. Well, and, the, and a, a great guitar solo as well on that song. Yeah, he was you a know. great guitar player. Come around, talk it over, something, and I sang it. Joe, there's on a vacation. Yeah, that'll work. That's a good little pop song. We didn't know it was going to be as big as it is now, you know, and it's, it was written so quickly. Well, was Josie a real person? Who was Josie? No, it's just not, it's not a, it's not a true story, but yeah. I like putting a positive spin on a tragic story, you see. <laughs> yeah, <I'm not> kidding. <laughs> It's got a distinctive guitar riff to start out, and then it's got that unforgettable opening line, you know, Josie's on a vacation far away, come around and talk it over. Right from there, you know what the song is. And throughout the entire song, it's like you're in seduction mode. But what's cool about it is you don't know what happens in the end. Yeah. People still ask this yeah, up to this day, you know, who's Josie? Sometimes I make a joke, so it's Napoleon writing about Josephine, and he was out to war, and they're like, Oh, really? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you about All the Love in the World. Just an outfield classic. Went to number 19 here. All the love in the world. Tell me the story behind that. Well, that was on, uh, on one of the, the songs on the demo tape that we sent to uh, CBS, which is now Sony. And that was like another tongue-in-cheek song that we... You know, we wrote and, and I said, look, well, let's just do a song called All the Love in the World, you know, let's, and that was a, a pop song. That was written very, very quickly as well. I, I think maybe all the bigger songs do get written quickly because you don't think about it and you don't know that you're like making a connection. consciousness, it just comes out. Yeah, we just didn't want anyone to think it was Dion Warwick singing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Good, Good point. Well, in 87, Bangin' came out, and of course, Since You've Been Gone went to number 31 off that record, and that's just a great rock song. What do you remember about recording that and arranging that song? We wanted to make sure that the album was 
a little bit more of a progression from Play Deep, you know, maybe a bit more darker, a bit more rockier. The recording period of that song was exciting for me. Yeah. So I remember um, in Air Studios in London, where we recorded both albums, uh, Play Deep and Banging, we had two levels uh, of the building. Now it's gone now. The Air Studios of London's gone. It's gone to West Hampstead. But it was upstairs and you had a pool room upstairs and was playing pool. And, and all the pockets were, were covered by paper cups because we didn't want to keep paying for, to play pool in a studio. We were paying huge amounts of money to, <laughs> yeah. to make a record there. So John came upstairs and said, do you, you want to listen to this? And I, I went downstairs and he did the, the guitar part. Da, na, 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 da, da, na, 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 na. And, I, and all the hairs on my neck stood up when I heard it on these huge JBL speakers. And I thought, wow. That's the beat. It was right there. Yeah. You know? Wow. Fantastic. Yeah. And the video, Wayne Isham directed the video for Since yeah. You've Been Gone. He came over. He's, he's a man from California and he's thinking everywhere is California weather. Well, in, in, in England, it, 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 it rains pretty much. Apart from this summer, we've had the best summer since 76. Wow. But that particular period of time, it was raining. So we shot some film on Hastings Beach. Uh, Devil's Dyke. We had about three or four different locations, and it rained. It rained. So you see the video, well, going like that. Yeah. It's raining. Yeah, yeah. Why did we film this here? <laughs> Since you've been gone. Well, in '89, Voices of Babylon, great album, and the title track is so mysterious, and it hit number 25 on the pop charts. What can you tell me about that song? This time at C CBS had said, we want you to make a bit, maybe more of a, a pop record this time. You've done the, Played It was the big selling album and it's played, Banging was, you know, it was good. But this had to be a turning point for us. We couldn't keep just, you know, recording your loves and your know, love in the world. The big and, power pop rock song. Since you've been gone. So we had to take a bit of a different direction. And David Kahn was our producer and he'd done Bangles. And he gave us that another angle to our sound. And Voices of Babylon was basically it, made up by uh, John and myself in, in, uh, in Scarf Studios. We had the big open calls. To, and he had a bass line, his bum, 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 bum. And that's all it started with was the bass line. And we built the, the chords on top of that. And that's how it became. It just grew and grew and uh, it's very much a production song. But a lot of people love that song and it's it's so different to what we've done. Musically, it's it's very different than anything you guys had ever done. But lyrically too, what did it mean? John wanted to put across like, you know, like back to the rhythm, like hit, you know, the, the natural thing of hitting a drum or making music from from the very beginning. Yeah. This is what we were trying to do, but in a in a pop song. Originally, he said, I've got this song called Warriors of Genghis Khan or something like that. I went, we can't use that. <laughs> no, 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 please, no. Yeah. no or, or about voices, voices, something, Babylon. Babylon's, you know, the, the utopia that everyone strives to get to. Yeah, that's, that's a great title. It's like you're speaking about the state of the world. In the last line, patiently wait for our turn to come, a small collection of the population. By the time our number's up, we could be gone. Yeah, I mean, John wasn't very big on politics or uh, he wasn't a philosopher, but it was our nearest thing to that. You yeah. Know, just give, just giving sort of messages that, you know, don't think too hard about it. This is just a pop song with these words that we had to take another direction. And, uh, and that album, it had a, a great flow to it, you know. And I love the very last verse when kind of goes out and you just hear your vocal come in. It's just, it's just a very powerful song. I always read into it, like you said, not political, but just about the state of the world. Yeah. And then the end saying like, we could all be gone someday, like go after yeah. it. I want to ask you about For You, which hit number 21 and your lead vocal there is just so emotional and melancholy. You can have Was that a real thing that you were going through to be able to record that song? Because it's a very uh, sad song. Yeah, I mean, that was sort of basically rearranged so many times and John wanted to capture a, 
you know, that sort of lost soul voice, you know, I'm, I'm really, really pleading, pleading, you know, I'm so sad, feeling, but since you left. He wanted that. He, very, he was a very big Steve Perry fan. And not, I was, I still am. And yeah. We wanted to capture that in a pop song, which, uh, you know, the, the same thing with a bass line, boom, 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 boom. We, we love that rhythm section approach to, to pop songs. And it just happened in the studio. It has uh, so many layers to it, that song. John bought a new keyboard and it sort of opened up his world of, you know, color and textures. And we think about this and I say about this bass line and a simple bass drum. I think, I think that how the song works is it's quite simplistic, really, you know, and still retaining our sound and, you know, not making it too busy as a backing track. Otherwise, you can't, otherwise the vocal doesn't sound personal. So we yeah. don't overanalyze our songs. It's just we we'll either capture the magic in the studio or we don't and we move on to something else. Interesting. Because when you say, try forgiven, I'm a broken man and you can have it any way you want it. I mean, there's just very emotional vocal there. I mean, it makes sense if, if yeah. you're approaching it in one or two or three takes because you're not going to be able to hit that emotion once you've done it seven or eight times. Well, if, after about 10 takes, John said, if, you, if you're not going to get the next take, I'm going to you know, <laughs> yeah. come in. And, and that, yeah, that, that taught me to get it right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I love the ending of it too because you have the light piano in the background as you're ending on your last few vocals. And your last vocal, I have to say, there's one of my favorite vocals ever. I love that. Just very powerful. John, of course, uh, passed on a, a few years ago from, from cancer and just a phenomenal songwriter. You, you and he had this power together to, to create incredible pop songs that we're still listening to now. What stands out to you about John, memories about him? We were very close. You know, I, I, I've lost my big brother, really. I mean, I shared a stage with him, the best part of 40 odd years. Um, especially with the the outfield for 33 years, and you know he he was always looking out for me. Every time I was in trouble and John was nearby, I, f I felt safe. He was always looking after me, and he just wrote some great songs, you know. And there's never going to be another John. No, you're never right. Never going to be another John Spinks. And uh, I I vowed that I would never ever go out a, and tour as the outfield. I'm totally from the outfield, but I'm not going to uh, put a band together called the Outfield because when he passed away, that's when the outfield passed away because you, yeah. you would never get, i never get a better songwriter, guitar player and person. And he was funny as well, really funny. And we were really, really close and I still, still miss him. Well, the new album, Out of the Darkness and then the new single, Into the Light, which very soulful song. You can hear a tribute to John in there. Yeah, I, th I, I, th I think the first three songs he was channeling me, I think. It, something was, you know, of his was, was com coming through me because I wanted it, the album to have the spirit of Outfield, but my spin on it. Me and my wife went to a local pub and she said to me, why don't you, you know, this, I've taken a four-year hiatus and, you know, she said, why don't you, like, this, is, this is like after about two years, of John's passing, she said, well, why don't you get back and just start recording? You know, it's what you do best. So I started do, doing some backing tracks and I lost my way a little bit lyrically. I was writing songs like, I'm going out tonight, I'm looking for a fight. And she said, do you think people would want to hear that in a song? I said, not really. And so she said, do you want to give you a hand? And she's very good at telling a story, but what? So put some lyrics to the backing tracks and it just all, all seem to fall into place, you know. Yeah. And some of the songs were written from scratch, from acoustic, recording into an iPad. And it was the most easiest process of writing and recording I've ever known. Well, if you close your eyes, when I was listening to the song when it came out, Into the Light, I mean, you sound like you sound in the 80s. I mean, you, your voice hasn't lost a step at all. I'm, I, I was impressed. Thank you. Yeah. It's all done with mirrors. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, it was great. And it's a great song too. Like I said, very soulful. And I like how it switches up at the end because, you know, it follows the, the basic pop song. But then at the end, in the middle eight there, you change it up. I love that. Why can't you see all the changes you made in and you can tell, I mean, I don't know 
whatever people believe in a higher power, whatever or beyond. But I think John was there in spirit for sure. I, I think so. You know? Definitely think so. I mean, if if yeah, you know, if John hadn't passed away, I would we'd still be making Battlefield albums. We wouldn't would not wouldn't have given up. You know, and he he fought right to the last week of his life. He'd still wanted to record and wasn't giving up. You know. But uh, yeah, but it, it, into the light, out of the darkness, it's it's got a couple of meanings, you know, out of the, the bereavement. But also, I've been known for all those years as the vocalist and bass player from the outfield, but I wanted to stand up and be counted. And look, I've got another strings to my bow. I produced the album myself, recorded all the instruments myself and the bass and the guitars and the drums and the yeah. keyboards. And just wanted to see if I could do it. And with my wife's help, Carol, with the words... You know, it's all seems, it all seems like a dream. You know, I, I really I know. don't know how I got here, but I'm here. It's 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 weird. It's a, it's a nice weird. It's a great return to yeah. to music, man. Yeah. Looking back on your life, what are you most grateful for in this moment? Oh, for a load of things. For having a a great family, great wife, supporting family, great fan base. Yeah. I mean, they've oh, been yeah. there since we first started out, eighty four, eighty five, and the and the the positive comments. On social media, it's just, just amazing. I'm just very lucky. I'm a very lucky man to be out here in the US again touring. I have, this is my first tour for 14 years. That's a long layoff, you know. And here we are, like, was it show six of the Retro Futura tour? And, I know. You know, I'm really. Well, I saw you were coming. I was so excited. I've never been able to see the outfield live. I mean, I grew up in Idaho in a small town and I didn't. Ever get to see? I've never that, seen so. them live either. <laughs> so, so I'm excited, but I got to tell you that it's been been an honor to sit down with you, Tony. Like you said that you didn't know what to expect, but I know because my friends feel the same way, and we grew up listening to this music. That this music means a lot. It's it's the soundtrack to our lives. So thank you so much for the music, and thank you for your time today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. <laughs>